Hi, hi, Stacy. <laughs> We're welcoming you to uh, her church and a new gallery. That's what this area is called. And a new stands for Art and Ecrastics by Women, with women. Ecrastic stuff is when one art form speaks to another. So it seems appropriate that Mary would bring us uh, information and sharing and illuminated texts from a wonderful poet that she's going to teach us from the Renaissance era. And in the midst of art by uh, our artist, Deborah Tash, who is right there, Yay! Debbie Watson. But today, we're here for Mary, who is, uh, has been an adjunct professor and teacher of art history for a long time, including at her alma mater, Vassar, right? And uh, so she is gonna knock your socks off. And so we dedicate this day to Christine de Pizan, and you share with us why we should do that. Good, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Stacy. <laughs> but before we begin, I would like to thank Pastor Stacy for giving me the opportunity to speak about one of my favorite subjects, Christine de Pizan. And I thank my dear daughter, Elizabeth Gibbons, for <laughs> and my friend Virginia Budney, who lives in New York, for their support and editing help in preparing this talk. Also, I dedicate this event to the memory of my two husbands, to Elizabeth's father, Felton Gibbons, who passed away 26 years ago today. Oh. And to my, my beloved soulmate, John Landor, who is surely here in spirit. So I am thrilled to be here to introduce you to Christine de Pizan, a woman writer of the Middle Ages who is one of our distinguished ancestors. While you feast your eyes on this image on the screen, showing Christine presenting her book to Queen Isabel of France, I shall sketch in some background on this extraordinary poet. This is an unusual scene, by the way, because for, for the first, uh, Christine, a woman, is presenting her book to the queen. And it takes place in the bedchamber of the queen, not in the official room in the palace. Also, I'd like you to notice Christine's dress, you'll see this many times during the talk, each time she appears in an illumination. Born in 1364, Christine lived in a society controlled completely by men, and she was a single mother with little means of support. Despite this, she became a successful and respected writer in a male literary profession, an extraordinary achievement for a woman at that time. Her own determination and courage enabled her to become the first woman to earn her living by her pen. Through her writing, she became an outspoken defender of women's rights. The spokesperson for the plight of women suffering from the blatant misogynistic character of her era. Her writing clearly reveals her as a visionary who used her art as a tool to empower women. In that sense, she was employing, before the fact, the method now known as intentional creativity. And we're so happy today to have Shiloh Sophia, and we are sorry Karen McLeod can't be here today, who with Sue Sellers and Lenore Strauss have been the leaders in creating the lineage that gave us rise to this method of intentional creativity. Born of Italian parents in Venice, Italy, Christine, at age three, moved to Paris with her family, where she spent the rest of her life, which ended about 1430. It was not her mother, but her father, Tommaso, prominent astrologer and physician to the French King Charles V, who encouraged and educated his very bright and inquiring daughter in the liberal arts, including Latin, which was very unusual in that day. It was a rare privilege for a woman, only nuns like the famous and learned Hildegard of Bingen had that opportunity. We learned from Christine herself that she resented her mother's attempts to restrict her learning to typical female skills like spinning. She writes in one of her poems through the voice of rectitude, 
It was because your mother, as a woman, held the view that you should spend your time spinning like the other girls, that you did not receive a more advanced or detailed initiation into the sciences. An amusing instance of how bad things were for women at that time was the case of Novella Andrea, who lived in the 14th century. When her father, a noticed, noted legist at the University of Bologna, was too busy, he sent her to substitute teach for him. But the clinker was she had to lecture from behind a curtain so as not to distract, <laughs> so, so as not to distract the male students. <clears throat> According to custom, Christine was married at 15. Her husband, chosen by her father, was a young clerk at the court, Etienne de Castel. It was a love match, as Christine makes abundantly clear throughout her writing. They had three children, but alas, then tragedy intervened. Etienne died in 1390, leaving Christine a widow at 25. Not only was she grief-stricken for the rest of her life at the loss of her beloved, but also she was suddenly responsible for supporting her children, her mother, and a niece. This was only the last in a series of tragic events that occurred over the span of less than a decade. Not quite a year after her marriage in 1380, Christine and all of France suffered the loss of their gifted and wise King Charles, one of her valued mentors. And in 1389, her adored father Tommaso died, soon to be followed, as we have seen, by the loss of her husband in 1390. In addition to the need to find funds to support the family, Christine was beset by financial troubles, debts, and lawsuits. <clears throat> Before her literary career began in the mid-1390s, Christine had worked as a copyist of legal lear and learned manuscripts in one of the many Parisian scribal workshops located near the king's palace, now the Louvre. This close involvement in the actual production of manuscripts was valuable preparation for Christine's subsequent work. She personally oversaw all aspects of the making of her manuscripts, including their illuminations, although she did not actually paint them. Christine in her study, which you see here on the screen, is not an actual portrait, but more of an iconic representation as she wished to be portrayed. And do notice that she's wearing this dress that we'll keep on seeing, that she dressed in, as I call it, her uniform. <laughs> on the left, you see the setup of a manuscript page. The text is copied first on parchment, made from the skin of sheep, goat, or calf, by a scribe according to a preliminary outline. So the text would have been put in first, probably in silver point. And finally, a measured space is left for the illumination to be painted in. Tempera mixed with egg yolk or a similar substance was the medium. The colors are made from plants, minerals, or chemicals, and even from insects. Then the illumination would be painted in by a paint, an artist. Christine was not an artist, but, but she was so closely associated that we can be sure that she gave lots of instruction. Then pages are grouped together in what are called choirs, four sheets of parchment folded to form eight leaves. Then they're all bound together and protected by a leather cover. The finished product is called a codex. Printing, as you may recall, did not appear until the mid-15th century with the publication of the Gutenberg Bible. Christine's first public forays in her writing career began with composing lyric poetry in several different genres. The most popular form, the ballad, were tales on the subject of love in all of its guises. Of the Christine's collection of ballads, the most famous is the very poignant Solette Sui, Alone Am I, so expressive of her abiding pain for the loss of her husband. She writes, and I quote just an excerpt, alone am I, and I wish to be alone. Alone my sweet love has left me. I am alone, without friend or mate. Alone am I, mournful and angry. This sharing of her personal feelings, no matter what the subject, 
is very typical of Christine's writing throughout her life. Gradually, she added to her repertoire long allegorical pieces in both poetry and prose, as well as historical and political tracts. Of the three main collections of her writing that survive, the Queen's manuscript in the British Library is the latest, most complete and elaborate, and is the one from which I'm showing you images. Christine presented this collection to the Queen in 1414. Selections from two of the 43 manuscripts that she produced during her lifetime exemplify her radical ideas. These two are the Livre du Chemin de Longue Etude, the Book of Long Learning, and the Cité des Dames, the City of Ladies. Learning from her own experience as a woman and a single mother, and from her extensive reading, Christine became the public voice for women. Her use of her own personal experience as the valid, even authoritative, foundation on which she based her observations and conclusions consisted a revolution at that time. Furthermore, her personal quest for self-identity and her mission to become a respected, authoritative author equal to her male counterparts inspired women of succeeding generations. Bearing in mind that Christine does not fit our modern paradigm of a feminist, but lived within the mores of her society, which held that women should be faithful, virtuous wives, and responsible, caring mothers, we observe how cleverly she interwove in her works her views on women's status. Solely by the aid of her pen, she devoted the rest of her life to establishing women's equality in two major ways. Through an outspoken defense of women's right to be respected, not defamed, and through the assertion that a woman's intelligence is not only equal to that of men, but that they have a right to be educated. Using the structure of traditional liter literary genres, Christine ingeniously transformed them into works which set forth her revolutionary views concerning women's rights. By 1400, through her contacts with the king, the queen, their relatives and other nobles, Christine was successful enough to be able to hire artists to illuminate her manuscripts. Her allegorical poem, The Long Road of Learning, written in 1402, is an example of how Christine transforms traditional forms into new paradigms. This image, for example, as you see, presents Christine presenting her book to Charles VI, who was the son and successor to Charles V. And you see this in an official uh, room, not in a bedchamber. Notice that she's wearing the same dress, this time gray instead of blue. Dante's Divine Comedy is the model for Christine's chemin, but her journey differs significantly from Dante's. First of all, the protagonists are all women, it, and it does not descend into the depths of hell. It takes place on earth and in the celestial spheres, where a lengthy debate on the state of the world occurs. The story of the Shemin opens as Christine falls asleep on the left. She is visited by a woman, the Cumaean Sibyl, the ancient prophetess of knowledge, who becomes her guide on this journey to all the marvels of the world, of the known world at that time, a journey that expresses Christine's passion for learning. At their first illuminated stop, the Bath of the Muses, here on the right, the Sibyl explains to Christine, the magnificent high mountain you see is Parnassus. The nearby fountain is the celebrated and renowned fountain of knowledge. The women you see bathing are the nine muses. They govern it, keeping it beautiful, clear, and pure. The horse you see is Pegasus, from whose hoof the fountain was born. And on the high hill you see Aristotle and other famous philosophers and poets of the past, including your father. As you see, the muses wear the same style headdresses as Christine has. 
these, this was standard for, I would say, middle class women of that era. The Sibyl, on the other hand, is clothed in what we imagine to be ancient uh, dress. This, the ladder to the heavens. After dispelling Christine's fears, which were both physical and psychological, about the dangers of mounting the ladder, that is the ladder of speculation, they then arrive at the um, celestial spheres, where Christine exclaims, my body, my limbs, and my eyes could not tolerate the brilliant light that enveloped me. That light struck my sight so strongly that it would have completely blinded me if my guide had not infused enough energy to support me. I was filled with such a desire to learn, to ponder, to reflect on all that was in this place that I would wish if it were possible that all my limbs would become eyes so that I could better see those beautiful things that I perceived. Finally, Christine and the Sybil arrive at the court of reason. The ensuing debate relates to Christine's urgent concerns about the perilous state of the world, and especially of France. For her life spanned the time of the Hundred Years' War, which began in 1337. Here Christine is astounded at the sight of five ladies on thrones, all sumptuously dressed. In the center, you see reason holds a sword and a laurel branch. Wisdom holds a book and at her feet, an armillary sphere, which was an instrument used to locate bodies in the heavens. Chivalry wears a helmet, armor carries a lance, and a castle is peeking out below at her feet. Wealth, attired in ermine and silk, holds a mallet for building, I imagine, expensive palaces. <laughs> And finally, nobility holds a scepter, and at her feet, you see this prostrate king. <laughs> this is a more detail. You can see the details better. An extensive debate follows, during which each lady defends her opinion at length. At the end, Christine is designated the emissary to return to the French court and carry with her the report of the debate. As soon as she arrives, she is awakened by her mother, who is shocked to see how long she's been in bed. This is the incipit of her famous book, The City of Ladies, which was the most widely read and translated of all of her works, and the culmination of her defense of women, written in 1404 and 5. Modeled on the antique genre of biographies of famous men and women, it is the first known history of women by a woman. Of course, Christine knew Boccaccio's manuscript of famous women, written in 1361 and 62, as well as the anonymous French translation of the work. But Christine's work presents a very different view. The title, City of Ladies, also recalls that of Augustine's City of God, which was a defense of the Christian church against the accusations that it caused the fall of the Roman Empire. Christine ingeniously transforms that work into a defense against the allegation that through Eve, womankind is responsible for the fall of man. The city Christine constructs is both built by and inhabited completely by women, drawn from all levels and eras of society, from antiquity to her time, from history, mythology, the Bible all virtuous, courageous women who contributed to their society and became models for posterity. I just want you to notice that the, the important uh, incipit here it has a full spread of the page in the manuscript as, as it's the one that introduces the, um, the whole book. And here you can see a detail. Mm. <clears throat> Um, it means the beginning. It's Latin for beginning. Mm -hmm. The City of Ladies, which was written in 1404 and 5, is a dream vision like the Long Road of Learning, but it had no patron. 
Instead, it was inserted into the various collections of Christine's works. It opens with Christine having just read Matthäus's Lamentations, a popular 13th century tract denigrating women. You wouldn't believe all the things that he said. She is sunk in the depths of despair as she contemplates the state of the world, and in particular, a pervasive misogynistic de defamation of women, so all-encompassing that she begins to believe in the vilification herself. Now hear what Christine says. All of a sudden, I saw a beam of light like the rays of the sun shine down into my lap. I woke with a start as if from a deep sleep and all at once saw before me three ladies crowned and of majestic appearance, whose faces shone with a brightness that lit me up. I was full of amazement and terrified that it might be some apparition that had come to tempt me. The lady who stood at the front of the three first addressed me. My dear daughter, don't be afraid, for we have not come to do you harm, but rather out of pity on your distress. We are here to comfort you. This lady was reason, holding up a shining mirror like a scepter. Whoever looks in this mirror will see themselves as they truly are. Reason continues. Stand up, daughter, and without further delay, let us make our way to the field of letters. We will build the city of ladies. Take the spade of your intelligence and dig deep to make a great trench all around. Then rectitude speaks. This splendid rule that you see me holding in my right hand, like a scepter, is the yardstick of truth, which separates right from wrong and distinguishes good and evil. Together we must construct the houses and buildings inside the walls of the city of ladies, which my sister Reason has now put up. Take up your tools and come with me. Mix the mortar well in your ink pot and set to on the masonry work with great strokes of your pen. It is now the turn of Justice, who says, this vessel of pure gold that you see me holding in my right hand is like a measuring cup given to me by God my Father, which I use to share out to each person exactly what he or she deserves. Here you see rectitude welcoming the ladies who are to inhabit the city. And she says, my dearest friend, it seems to me that our building is well underway and that the city of ladies now has plentiful housing all along its wide streets. It is high time that we begin to fill this city with people. The ladies that we are going to invite here will be sufficient in number to last for all time. And here is justice welcoming the virgin queen of heaven. Justice says, as I promised you I would, I shall bring you a most noble queen, she who is blessed amongst all women, to dwell with her fine company. Let every woman now come forward and say with me, we greet you, O queen of heaven, with an Ave Maria, the same greeting that the angel of the Annunciation made to you and which gives you more pleasure than any other form of address. The virgin replied, Justice, my son's dearly beloved, I will gladly come to live amongst these women who are my sisters and friends, and I will take my place at their side. The cite concludes with Christine's address to all women. Most honorable ladies, praise be to God. The construction of our city is finally at an end. All of you who love virtue, glory, and a fine reputation can now be lodged in great splendor inside its walls. Not just women of the past, but women also those of the present and the future. For this city has been founded and built to accommodate all deserving women. Mm -hmm.